Hey everyone, welcome back to Writer's Chat. We're so glad that you're joining us, whether you're here today as we do this live or if you're watching the replay, we're very, very glad to have you. If you are watching the replay, we do invite you to join us any Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock uh, Central, 11 o'clock Eastern, and to join our Facebook group, uh, Writer's Chat. Just look for Writer's Chat members. My name is Johnny Alexander. I'm one of the co-hosts, joined by my daughter, Bethany Jett, and and Melissa Stroh. And Melissa is a special co-host today because our special guest is her publisher. Um, Hallie Bridgman is with us. I'm going to introduce Hallie to you and then turn it over to her because she's just got a lot of great teaching on writing in layers. So here we go with nearly a million sales, which is phenomenal. Hallie Bridgman is a best-selling Christian author who writes action-packed, romantic suspense, focusing on realistic characters, who face real world problems. Her work has been described as everything from refreshing to heart stopping, exciting, and edgy. Hallie has served as the director of the Kentucky Christian Writers Conference, president of the Faith, Hope, Love chapter of the Romance Writers of America, is a, is a member of the American Christian Fiction Writers, the American Christian Writers, and Novelist Inc. She's an accomplished speaker and has taught and inspired writers around the globe from Sydney, Australia, to Dallas, Texas, to Portland, Oregon, to Washington, DC, and all places in between. Hallie loves coffee, campy action movies, and regular date nights with her husband. Above all else, she loves God with all of her heart, soul, mind, and strength, has been redeemed by the blood of Christ, and relies on the presence of the Holy Spirit to guide her. What a great bio. Hallie, Thank we're you. so glad to have you with us. Thank you. Um, I actually, I was drinking coffee and realized I had my serious writer coffee mug with me. <laughs> Yay! That wasn't even, that's not even a prop. That's just like, it's my favorite mug because it's so big. Yeah, it's a <laughs> big <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That is great. <laughs> I have like four of them. I think I had one on behind me for a while. Oh, I love that. So. Um, well, can I... I well, I was going to ask you, right before you get started, I know you just had the Kentucky Christian Writers Conference, and I heard it was a big success, and it was a it virtual was. conference this time. Is there anything you just want to tell us really quick about the conference? Um, I, I was overwhelmed with the way that God <laughs> put us, like, I know that our committee was decided before Earth was created to be <laughs> the committee that brought that conference. Oh, wow. And the way that it all just happened so not lack of work but smooth anyway um mm -hmm. was just a testament to god's god's love of our craft when we give it to him and uh yeah. we are actually it's been on my list i have a list of things to do and i just came out of a deadline and finished a book so i have to get to it but we're we had originally just said you know just the people that attended the conference live can have access to everything but the committee has decided that we will make it available to everyone so wow. um, that's on my list of things to do is to go in and create that part of the website so that everyone can come in and and and, and have the conference because it was the holy spirit was there and oh, it was amazing cool. It was amazing. Well, congrats on that. I know that was Thank a big you. thing to pull off. And, and I know a lot of our writers chat community attended different classes and different workshops and signed up for that. So yeah, we just want to give it a plug. <laughs> it was wonderful. Thank you for doing that. And I'm glad that I had a chance to tell you that we will have it available. Yes. To everyone. Yeah, that is great. Uh, there's a couple of my committee members are here. I see them. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought so. I know Rhonda Dragomir is. I'm not Rhonda sure and else. Janet. Yeah. Okay. I'm not yeah. sure who else is on there. I don't know. I don't, I can't see everyone, but yeah. I, I think that's all. Crystal. Crystal taught. Yeah. So. Great. Good. All right. I'm going to tell you that my air is out. Our maintenance guy is coming Thursday. So I'm going to put my hair back because <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm already feeling it. <laughs> That's fine. So, all right. Are you ready for me? We're ready for you. All right. Go for okay. It. So I'm going to start a PowerPoint. Okay. Um, if it'll let me, let me see. I need you to give me that permission. Oh, okay. And I want to let you know that I teach very well if I'm interrupted with questions. Okay. <laughs> so if people have a question of something that I'm saying, please feel free to interrupt me and ask it. Um, and I really, that's really part of my teaching style is to encourage that. Okay. We will be monitoring the chat then and 
I brought yes. it closer so I could see it easy. <laughs> My husband, Greg, is with me today. He is going to be reading a scene from one of my books when the time comes. Okay. Um, I can't read this scene because it's about a woman saying goodbye to her husband as he leaves for war. And that has been my experience too many times in my life. And I get too emotionally involved in it and I can't read. <laughs> so the times that I've been teaching without him and I've had to have that scene, I've, I actually have a recording of him doing it. Oh my gosh. Wow. Well, we're so, but it's a great that. scene and it's perfect for this because it's short <laughs> enough to like show all the layers. And yeah. so that's why I use it, but it's, I can't read it. So um, uh, we're glad to have Greg here too. In. So he can pop in when you're ready for it. Yep. So, that's but, awesome. um, let's see. I'm just going to share my screen entirely because I might bounce around. That's fine. And, uh, let's see. There we are. Okay, so um, I'm Hallie Bridgman, and this is my my class writing layers, and these are my books. Um, and I would, and the reason that I teach this class is because these books were all written and published in a seven year time frame. And some of them were written, I have an eight book series that I wrote in uh, a six month time frame, And, and that was a really complicated one. And it's one that I, I wouldn't go back and do again because I was traveling a lot and teaching a lot that year. And I had planned on just using the hotel rooms, the uninterrupted time, no children, whatever. And I found out I couldn't write in a hotel room. And so I would come home and like look, lock myself in my office and write my World War II series in the three or four days a week I was at home. And so uh, Greg and the boys say for six months they were war orphans as I wrote those series. But um, it, having to write them so fast and get them out because they were all up for pre-order and I had the dates were set and I couldn't change them, what that created was... Uh, the perfection of my process. And so that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. So I can write a book, I can write a hundred thousand word novel in four weeks. And I can have it completely ready to go to editors in a four week time period. And that's what I'm going to show you today. I call it writing in layers. So before I begin writing, the first thing I do is I develop my characters. And I don't consider that part of the time. So when I'm creating my writing schedule, I, I actually make it eight weeks because I need time to uh, develop my characters. Then I need the four weeks to write it. And then I need time to do a self-editing. And my self-editing is not part of this class, but it's incredibly extensive. And so I actually give myself eight weeks for each book to write. Um, so when I establish my characters, I know everything about them. Um, I know how they dress. I know what they eat and why they eat it. I know their level of education and where that ed education was achieved. I know if they had issues with teachers uh, or subjects. Um, I know about their parents. I know their parents' backgrounds and their backstories. And I know their perspective on faith. Uh, and I, I would say that when you're developing your characters, this is your brain and how you do it is, is it's important that you do it the way that your brain can understand it and how it can retain it because no one else's brain is like yours. So for instance, I use Pinterest, which is a very strange way to develop characters, but I'm a very visual person. And so I build my characters on Pinterest by looking up pictures and homes and families and uh, tattoos and jewelry and clothing. I'm a very visual person. I cannot describe a room that I haven't seen. And so if I want to, you know, put my character in a house, I will go to houses that are for sale, find the house my character lives in and pray that the pictures of the sale are furnished because that's what then becomes my character's house. Uh, and so I do that with also those really cool fashion, uh, where it's the picture of the shirt and the pants and the dress or the purse and the scar, all the things that go with it, but no one's in it. Yes. Like, I love those things. That's how I dress my characters. Uh, and, and I, so that's how I just build a Pinterest board about my book and I do it just, it almost, it almost seems like I'm wasting time just surfing the internet, but the whole time 
every time I see a picture that that resonates with my character, I'm building more of their characterization in my mind. Um, some people use binders. Uh, I, I went to, a, at Romance Rise of America, there was, I think it was Judith McNaught spoke about her process of characterization and she builds like an actual binder, almost like a scrapbook for each book that's filled with the same things that I do on Pinterest, but she does it in a binder. And it takes her a year to build that binder. It was Judith McNaught. And uh, she said that one time her publisher said, we don't have time for that. You need to just write this book, do it quickly. And she found that she was unable to write the book because she hadn't built the binder. And, and I realized that I do the same thing I'm writing the book as I'm doing this. Like it's already getting built in my head. The, 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 the premise, the conflicts, all of that is happening as I'm building my characters. Um, and, and it took her just as long to write the book than it would have if she had built the binder and then written the book. Um, some people use programs. There's, there's programs you can use. Scrivener allows you to do characterization. Uh, there's a Microsoft one touch does there's a way that you can build character sheets, you know, whatever it's, it is, it's whatever one it note. works. What? One note? It's one note. Yeah. I think every time I've ever taught this class, you have corrected me. Uh, you were probably ready. I'm ready. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm but, bad. But I, I will one touch you. It. I'll one touch you later. <laughs> anyway, there's all sorts of, of, of programs out there or I created, um, a worksheet. Let me see if I can open it. And here's my character worksheet. And you can get the website I put in the chat. And it just is everything that you need to know about your character. There, here's a worksheet. And it doesn't have to be filled out for every character. I would find that so tedious. But I know that there are there are authors who need to fill this out the same way that I need to build a Pinterest board. And it just is the way that your brain works. So, and some people use note cards. Do what works for you. Don't feel like your way of building your, your own characters is wrong. Oh, there's my character worksheet. So that's on my website that's the link is and it's free. Like just take it if that's what you want. Um, and if that will help you with your characterization. So characterization. By the time I'm ready to start writing my book, by the time I've built my characters, this part is easy because so much of it is in my brain. But before I talk about my process, um, Greg is going to read the scene from Charity's Code, which is book three in my uh, Virtues and Valor series, which is a World War II series about seven female spies um, in occupied France in World War II. And, uh, as he reads this scene, I want you to understand that I wrote this book from beginning to end. It's um, like 25,000 words, so it's a novella. In two weeks, I had this, including the scene, which is like emotional that I, enough that I can't even read it. So um, this is the scene that we're going to take apart in my writing and layers process. So hit it. London, right. England, 1940. Dorothy stood on the platform of the train station as close as she could to her husband, who looked like a recruiting poster in his RAF officer's uniform. He easily pulled her out of the way to avoid an unintended jostling by a group of soldiers running to hop aboard a departing train. His touch, as always, felt astonishingly gentle for a man of his enormous size as he guided her to safety. Feet back on the ground and needing something to do with her hands, she straightened Tom's tie and swallowed trying to disguise her distress and trying very hard not to cry. She was determined that his last memory of her before he left would not be of womanly tears. There you go, Captain Ewan. I believe you'll be the most handsome pilot in the RAF, though I confess I'm still a bit astounded they make aircraft large enough to lift you from the earth. He cupped her cheek and brushed a thick thumb beneath her eye, capturing the moisture threatening to fall down her cheeks. Only in your eyes, love, but I shall certainly be the most courageous, that I vow. I will protect you and our children with every shred of courage my heart and body can muster. He kissed her softly, <laughs> he kissed her so softly that the breath hitched in the back of her throat. 
Their lips parted and his deep voice echoed in her chest as he said, you mind after the bairns, remind Tommy he's the man of the house now and must help you with his sisters. I think the lad understands, she said with a smile. Even at eight, he grasped the enormity of our present circumstances. He's brilliant, that laddie, just like his mother. Tom's occasional Gaelic brogue never failed to turn her knees to water. And stout and clever, just like his da, she responded. Suddenly, his arms went round her, strong and tight, comforting her as only he could. You'll stay in my heart and in my prayers, bin Sheil. Pray for me, my darling, my bonnie dottie. I'll never stop, my grech. Their lips met as naturally and as comfortably as taking the next step when walking or the next breath when breathing. They came together in a kiss exactly as they had perhaps tens of thousands of times before over the course of their courtship and marriage. His hands rested on her hips, her fingers caressed his smoothly shaved cheeks as his wax mustache tips tickled the backs of her hands. She kissed him soundly, but despite the triviality of its beginnings, this kiss felt somehow important. It felt bittersweet and frighteningly final. Her heart thundered in her ears and she suddenly wanted to just kiss him and kiss him and kiss him and never stop. She desperately wanted all the clocks to stop ticking. She wanted all the trains to rust under their tracks and stop moving. She urgently wanted this wretched war to end in the very next second so that she could just kiss her husband and pour every ounce of love she kept in her heart into him. A shrieking train whistle startled her back to the present moment in which clocks still ticked, trains still rolled, and soldiers still made their way to the front lines. She opened her eyes as their lips parted and beheld the present reality, a reality in which wives still remain behind, minding children, keeping busy, staying useful, and fearing every moment that the last time they had seen their husbands alive would be the very last time. After seconds that passed like hours, her heartbeat faded to distant thunder in her ears instead of deafening nearby cannon fire. Knowing one of them had to be the first to break away, she stepped back, slipped her gloves back on, then brushed a hand down her wool coat. Go on then, don't miss your train. I imagine even kind old King George would frown on tardiness as a result of dallying with your wife on the platform. Well, his majesty's never met my wife. Had he done, I'd wager he might understand. His eyes looked down into hers, dark with passion and promise. She realized in that heartbeat that this image of him would be the one she carried with her in her mind's eye throughout the coming days and carried to sleep with her each night. Oh, Thomas, you are quite the charm. I always have done. He hopped up onto the step of the train, surprisingly agile as always, and turned to blow her a kiss. I love you, Mrs. Ewan, with all my heart. And I you, Captain Ewing. Their hand, a hand slapped Tom's shoulder from behind, almost knocking him off the step. Let's go, old boy, off to see the elephant and whatnot, Sir Percy announced. He glanced over Tom's shoulder. Send me some of those wonderful biscuits in the post when little Tommy isn't looking, Dorothy. She laughed and waved as the train's whistle blew again. When she knew they could hear her again, she said, Assuming I can get sugar rations, I'll send just as many cookies as they'll allow. But you must promise me to watch out for my husband, Sir Percy. Madam, Captain Ewing just shot to the very tip top of my priority list, he promised with a wink. Dorothy did not chase the train. The platform was far too crowded and she chose not to make a spectacle of herself or her husband. Instead, she waved and Tom waved back until she simply could not see him anymore. Her gloved fingers brushed her swollen lips where she still tasted him. Her lips tingled, still feeling his lingering kiss, as if feeling the sensation of an amputated limb. Dejectedly, she turned and walked away slowly, completely alone, back down the platform, back to their old car, so that she could collect her children from her neighbor Beatrice in time to prepare dinner. She tried very, very hard not to burst into tears. Thank you. Okay, so let's break this scene down and figure out how I wrote it. So what I'm going to tell you the way that I do is my, I do my entire book at one time this way. So each layer is the whole book over again, not just chapter by chapter, scene by scene. So, um, so the first thing I do is just as a, like a pseudo outline. Um, and I do it in Scrivener. And I can actually show you one that I'm working on. Let me open up my current work in progress. I'm writing a Christmas novella. 
that's due September 1st and I'm three chapters into it. So here is what it looks like for me. So here's chapter one and then I don't chat, I don't number any more chapters because sometimes I drag them around or I'll insert a chapter because I know that this is all action, action, action. Oh, I need something that's not so action. Um, I need something that builds character. I need something that sets more of a scene. And so, so basically I start with just all the action of what's going to happen and how is the plot being driven and where are the conflicts and how do they, how do they lay up into the story? And then I go back in and, and if it's a longer novel, like a full length novel, um, instead of this shorter novella, this will be like 10 or 12 chapters and it will be 30 to 40,000 words when it's over. Um, then I'll, then that's when I go in and fill in more story, add a subplot, maybe a couple of extra characters. And, but it's all, what happens in this chapter? What happens? Where are they? What time of year is it? Because like this one is starting in, a, in 12 chapters, I'm going from March to Christmas. And so I need to know like rapid movement through the year and how much development has happened with my characters in that time and what is happening in this chapter. Uh, and so that's, I do it in Scribner. Some people can do this with a, with a piece of paper and it'll be, uh, you know, A, I, Roman numeral one, letter A, number one. You know, mine is just chapter one, this, then chapter this, who, what, where, when, why. Um, so in this scene, it was Dorothy Ewing, housewife, and Captain Thomas Ewing, RAF pilot, parting ways, perhaps forever as Thomas leaves for war. And I know as the author that he's going to become a prisoner of war, and the rest of the books are all about the planning and execution of the rescue of the people that are in the prison with him. Um, when is this? 1940 during the Blitzrieg. Where? A train station north of London. And why? The intent of this chapter, this scene, is to establish Dory's, Dorothy's emotional and spiritual state as her story begins. That's the only reason for this chapter. Um, and that would be what I had written down in my outline. So, oh, I wanted to tell you, so this picture, <laughs> so I have a good friend who's a painter, and she put up this picture on Facebook, and she's like, Oh, the first layer of my oil painting is done. And I was like, oh, and I sent her a message and I said, can you please take a picture with every layer? Because this is exactly what I teach. And it's so hard to, you know, find a way to do it visually. So this is, this was her first layer. And so that's, that's, that's when I came up with writing in layers as my title. So, um, so then the next thing is dialogue and action. And this is honestly just dialogue and action. He walked into a room he said this, he walked out of the room. I don't set the scene. I don't uh, fill in thoughts and emotions. I don't describe what anyone is wearing or what they're smelling or what they're seeing, unless it pertains to what they're saying. So it's almost as if I'm writing a movie script without the constraints of the format of a movie script. And sometimes it's important for me to remember that I need to, I need to add more about this scene later. So for instance, I would have put in brackets, make this kiss really emotional. But then the words I would have written were, they kissed. He said this, she said that, they kissed. He got on the train, Sir Percy said this, she said that, the train went away, she walked away. And that would have been all I wrote. Because all that I need to do right now is get this movie that's in my head out onto the paper as fast as I can before I lose it. Typing as fast as I can or speaking into Dragon as fast as I can. The importance is getting this, this story out that I can see in my head. Everything else can come later. Everything else can be added later. I don't I don't bog myself down with any details that don't have anything specific to do with action and dialogue. So when I'm writing dialogue, it's very important that it's always natural and never contrived. And I use dialect and jargon, as you can see in this, in the scene that Greg read, but I don't, overwhelm my reader with it to the point where they're like, what? Um, I just do it enough to 
to enunciate the characterization. So it's important to have their their background, their class, because we're in Great Britain. Um, he's Scottish, she's Irish, you know, so um, that's important as just part of their characterization so that it builds it in the, in the reader's mind. So um, in, in my original setup, I may or may not add the jargon and inflection, but it's part of my going back through the dialogue and making sure that it sounds right. And, and, and if I read dialogue out loud and it sounds stilted, out of place, unrealistic, not something someone would actually say, then I scratch it. It's not there. I find another way to convey what I have said in, in the narrative instead of in the dialogue. I was reading a book one time and uh, it was crazy because this is an author I enjoyed up until I never read another one. But so it's, it's historical romance. This woman is on a ranch in the middle of nowhere and she's a widow and there's a bad storm outside and she hears the barn door slam and she doesn't want to go outside because she's afraid of the storm but she she has to go secure the barn and so she takes her husband's shotgun that's bigger than she is and she like fights the wind into the barn and there is a man in there and she's alone on a ranch in the middle of nowhere and a strange man is in the barn and they start having a conversation instead of her, you know, shooting him. And he says, what is this place or where am I? I don't remember. But then she goes on this long three-page narrative ver uh, dialogue about her grandfather finding this land and the, the pond he found on it and setting up the house and doing all these things for three pages there's this man in her barn in the middle of a storm. And I was like, nope, done. I can't read this book anymore because that's not how a woman is going to not only act, but that's not how she's going to speak to the stranger. So um, unless they were going to establish the fact that she was insane and they hadn't done that. So I just left it alone and I quit reading it. So it's important that the, that the dialogue sounds right, that the, that the dialogue is natural and normal and that it's a, uh, stays true to your characters that you've created. Yeah. Hallie, we've got some comments. Not yes, please. Per se, but um, everybody loved the chapter. And then um, Rhonda says, she said it's great because she can get bogged down looking for the perfect words. And then she loses the thread of the story plot. And then my mom was kind of agreeing with that, like through the process of trying to make it perfect so you don't move on with the story. So just um, a lot of kudos to the process of being able to to write in this layer and give yourself permission, I guess, to yeah. be able to do that. Exactly. And I'll tell you, one of the things that um, part of my editing process is to search for passive verbs because uh, I, I intentionally write very actively. And so I don't want my uh, um, manuscript to be filled with passive verbs. And uh, Melissa's nodding. <laughs> She's been <laughs> edited by Greg, so she knows. But um, I, my first draft, when I, when I edited Valerie's Verdict, my, not Valerie's Verdict, Alexander's Appeal, the book that I have on pre-order that's at the, you know, the round of editors. Um, when I searched for the word was, I found 944 instances of the word was. And some of them were in dialogue, which is fine. We speak passively naturally, and so I leave them. But that was not just one of the passive verbs. There was 944 instances, but that's okay. And I've tried to write actively in my narrative, and it throws me off. Like I freeze, and my brain freezes, and I can't keep writing because now I'm stuck with how to word the stupid sentence instead of just writing what I see. And it is. It's, I, have, I have given myself permission to write it however I want to write it because there's nothing that can't be fixed in the editing process. And that's why I give myself like two solid weeks of editing time when I finish a book. I think so many people get stuck right there. So like that, I think 
it's, it's not, it's like, this is all amazing. But I think if somebody leaves here and says, okay, I can write fast now. I think that's <laughs> a win for all of us. This is yeah, yeah. Now you might have to edit slow, but you can certainly <laughs> write fast. Yeah. And I think that um, I have never done, I, and so if I'm copying anything from like the, what's it called? Novel month, right? right and NaNoWriMo or whatever. Yeah. My understanding, because I've never done it, um, but is that they give you permit, they tell you to give yourself permission to just get the draft out is that, if the, am I understanding that? Yeah, um, my mom's first book, the one that Tyndale published actually was, came from a NaNo story okay. years before. And I know, I, mom, you're still muted, not because of the dogs, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually my first two books that were published started out as NaNo, like call them my NaNoWriMo drafts, you know, novels. And, and it was great just to have that freedom and it really helped a lot. But I still have a hard time doing it when I'm then you know have a contract to write a book. I'm still like laboring over it. But Nana worked great about doing that. So I mean, it helped see how the story functioned, how what was good with it, what wasn't good with it, you know, all that kind of thing. Because when you, when you go in there, you're just going in with a blank slate, pretty much. At least way back then, that was the idea. Now, oh, I know a lot of people do prep for Nano ahead of time. I think that they get that original outline done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> but I, since we're talking, I'll just apologize for making some of y'all cry out there. <laughs> Is that what people are saying? <laughs> I can't, re like, you can imagine why I would have a hard time reading that. Um, so in like, so here's the exam and please, um, Bethany, just to interrupt me like that. That's perfect. So, so I've added inflection. I've added, uh, cultural dialogue I've added parlance uh, and it just and so that it will read normal and natural uh, and then I go back in and I add how how they speak she said with a smile his Gaelic brogue um, his deep voice echoed in her chest so all of those things are just added elements to the scene that just pull the reader even deeper into the scene for you that's adding the inflection to the to the dialogue and making it making them feel the dialogue like the characters are feeling it so the next layer um does anyone have any questions about dialogue before i go on to the next one i can't see the chat i don't see any yet but if okay pop in all right so thoughts this one i have a hard time with because i feel like my dialogue should give you all the thoughts you need however my editors disagree with me and they force me to put the thoughts in so what is she thinking what is he thinking are they teaching anything learning anything analyzing anything forecasting planning remembering and you need to do the thoughts in a way that doesn't tell <laughs> you want it to show not tell and you want these thoughts to fit everything else that's happening and so in this scene specifically when she looks at her husband he looked like a recruiting poster in his RAF officer's uniform now I imagine I'm going to guess that you guys could picture this couple on this train station platform as I was reading it but I would also I never described him not once she thought about how he looked like a poster but that's the most you're getting and he has like the tips of his waxed mustache. That's all you're getting from me about him, but you don't need any more than that because you're getting her thoughts and feelings about him and it's giving you your own impression of who he is in, his, in your mind. Um, so that's a thought of hers. One of her other thoughts was she was determined that his last memory before he left would not be of womanly tears, which is something that very clearly establishes her character. She is a strong woman. She's gonna carry her family through this war and she's going to do it, and she's not going to be weak when she does it. Um, and, and his thoughts and feelings are important to her, and so she wants him to be strong. And how is he going to be strong? Because she is. And so it gives him permission to be strong because he's not having to comfort this weak and, and tearful woman. And so all of those things are the types of things that are thoughts added to the dialogue and action to help establish character, to help drive the story, to in, in, in introduce conflict, um, to help promote the plot, you know, whatever that may be. 
And like I said, the purpose of this scene was to establish her character and her state of mind as the war and as the as her story began, because the Virtues and Valor series uh, was eight books told. It's all the same story: the planning and execution of the rescue of a wireless operator and this prison full of prisoners, told from eight different points of view. And so this was her point of view. So then once I establish all the thoughts, now I go in and see, okay, now there's gonna be holes where I need to establish feelings. And what is not established through just thought and what is not established through dialogue, now I need to establish for feelings. What is the main character feeling? Are there any hidden feelings that can be uh, shown to the reader through more action or more dialogue? Um, are the feelings, clear that the characters are feeling. And I, I'm of the mind that if someone walks in and slams something on a table and then storms out, I should have a good idea of what those feelings are, but I might need to, you know, add a little to it just to, just to make sure that it's clear. Um, and what feelings is the main character repressing and expressing? Because it might be two different things, like Charity is completely torn in the scene. And so you're getting her internal feelings and what she is ex exhibiting to her husband. So, Here's some feeling. Despite the triviality of its beginnings, this kids felt somehow, I need to move the people on my screen. How do I do that? Okay, there. But despite the triviality of its beginnings, this kiss felt somehow important. It felt bittersweet and frighteningly final. Her heart thundered in her ears and she suddenly wanted to just kiss him and kiss him and kiss him and never stop. She desperately wanted all the clocks to stop ticking. She wanted all the trains to rust into their tracks and stop moving. She urgently wanted this wretched war to end in the very next second so that she could just kiss her husband and pour every ounce of love she kept in her heart into him. Now, it would be really super easy to say she really loved her husband and she hated that he was going off to war, which is exactly what this paragraph of feelings exhibits. But this gives the reader her feelings. The war is not bad, it's wretched. She loves her husband with every ounce of of fiber in her. He is her one. He is the other half of their one. He is the father of her children. He is, is her husband and she wants him to know how much she loves him through her kiss. And those are her feelings in this scene. And then you let the scene color the characters. And what does that mean? What do I mean by that? Use senses to build or contrast emotion and let the aspect of the scene color the characters. So for instance, if you are waiting on a train to come and you hear the whistle, it's a happy sound. Someone's on that train coming home and that is the anticipated sound, the train whistle. But in this scene, the shrieking train whistle startled her back to the present moment in which clocks still tick, trains, I can't see there's people move, let's see, whoops. Um, trains still rolled and soldiers still made their way to the front lines. She opened her eyes as their lips parted and beheld the present reality, a reality in which wives still remain behind minding their children, etc. So in this scene, the train whistle is a negative thing. It's startling, it's shocking, it's shrieking, and it pulls her out of this love that she's pouring into her husband, and it probably startled the reader, um, because you're deep into this love for her husband and then a shrieking train whistle, and suddenly, suddenly you're no longer with these two people as they're saying goodbye, suddenly you're back on this busy train platform, and you remember that there's people bustling around and soldiers loading up and, and wives saying goodbye. And it can be, I did, I did a scene one time where it was a transition from fall into winter and it was like icy and ice turned to snow and rain pelted down on the city and for, you know, for days it was gray, but Robin was warm inside this cocoon of, you know, this love that she felt for Tony kind of thing. And so that was, that's what, that's how you can use it to contrast what's happening. Like here's the setting up of the scene. So we're establishing all these things, but in the warmth of her home is this, is the security of this love kind of thing. So 
You can use it either way, you can do both. And then the final touches, um, deliver the climax, denouement, or the hook of the scene. You want, you want the reader to switch scenes. You want them to say, okay, next. <laughs> you don't want them to put the book down. And so how are you going to, to establish that? And then you also have a point. You had a point when you started the scene. So make sure that the emotional or spiritual or plot point or something is driven home through what you're writing. And so the final, uh, the final couple paragraphs, Dorothy did not chase the train. The platform was far too crowded and she chose not to make a spectacle spectacle of herself or her husband. Again, that's more characterization for her and thoughts and feelings. Instead, she waved and Tom waved back until she simply could not see him anymore. Her glove fingers brushed her swollen lips where she still tasted him. Her lips tingled, still feeling his lingering kiss as if feeling the sensation of an amputated limb. Dejected, she turned and walked slowly away, away slowly, completely alone, back down the platform, back to their old car so that she could collect her children from her neighbor Beatrice in time to prepare dinner. She tried very, very hard not to burst into tears. So here's a couple of things. One is um, she's still not going to cry, even though she's completely alone, even though she feels alone and no one knows her, can see her, she's still going to maintain that strength. And she does the entire book. That's part of her characterization. But she also is incredibly suddenly separated from the other half of her one. And she feels it like in her soul. And so that is the intent of this this scene this is why the scene was written and that closes this scene out for my for my readers and allows them to now know who charity is her name is not charity what is it dorothy her code name is charity if i've called her charity this whole time i apologize if i confuse you um i'm really bad with names and i had two names for all of these people because they had their code name and their real name <laughs> it throws me talking about the books but um it, it establishes who she is for the rest of the book. And she maintains that same characterization the entire time until her husband is back home with her, which is a spoiler, but I apologize. I'd like so, to make a little comment on that too. I love how in that scene, I mean, it's been so, you know, it's been romantic and intimate and heart wrenching. And then you see her like as she's walking, she's having to go back into normal. And it's such, you know, into picking up the children, preparing dinner, and making that switch. I mean, it's, it's a brilliant way to end this scene. Taking her it's like, and she had to make yeah. an actual mental switch. Yeah. 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 Yes. Which is why she wouldn't allow herself to cry right. because now she has to go be strong for her children. Yep. And it's almost as if she lets it out. It's not going to stop. So yeah, she's just not going to let it out. And she's got to be normal in this very abnormal situation. Right. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Thank you. Yes. Very powerful. So like my friend's painting that she did, you know, everything up, oh, it's, hold on. I think it does it automatically. I think I told it to start to, I don't know, whatever. That's supposed to be an animated thing. <laughs> <laughs> so um, anyway, that's my process. That's how I write in layers. Uh, and I do that with every book. And like I said, I start at the beginning and I go to the end. And then I start back at the beginning and I go to the end. And I start back at the beginning and I go to the end. And I do that five times, minimum five times, until it's time to edit. And then I do my editing process is another class. <laughs> so. Wow. Did we miss any questions? Uh, I wasn't able to see the chat either, so I don't know exactly. I just saw things that would pop up. There were a lot of comments, but I didn't see like, like specific questions, just people agreeing or kind of talking about the, about the scene. And um, oh, we got one. All right, do you do this process for each scene slash chapter or all through the story from Leslie? I do this for the entire book throughout the story. So, so like that action and dialogue part where it's just action and just dialogue, I start at the beginning of the story and I go all the way to the end. And so I get to the end and then I'm done with action and dialogue. And now it's time to go back in and make sure that my dialogue is good and, and use inflection and everything. And I just hit the dialogue and I read it out loud as I'm doing this. And then I go in and add the thoughts. I set the scene, you know, did I have set the scene in there? I can't believe I, yeah, I that slide must have disappeared. Color the, 
Call, okay, let the scene. Yeah, I do set the scene. So, and so that's on, uh, just a, just a footnote on my screen. There's buttons on the bottom participants chat share screen record and reactions. If you click on the chat button, it should pull the chat up. Okay. I could see it like popping up with numbers, but <laughs> I, I was what I was concerned about was that it would I couldn't see what you guys could see. And since I had shared my entire screen, I was worried that it would come in the middle of my PowerPoint and you guys would yeah. miss them. Lots of questions. So, go ahead. <laughs> Oh, no, go ahead. If you want to finish answering that one's good because we got lots coming in. Well, I was going to say that um, setting the scene is not something that I do right away because that's the hard part for me. The action and dialogue is easy for me. The thoughts and feelings are harder, but I do them. Setting the scene is very hard for me because I don't, I don't think that way. And so that's when I have to stop and look at where, where's my Pinterest board? What did her house look like? What did that room look like? What was she wearing? And this time, you know, describe his tattoo again. And that's when I have to like kind of slow down and make sure that each scene is set. And I have like a, I have this thing underneath my monitor that says, don't be lazy, color, smell, sound, taste, temperature, thoughts, feelings. Mm -hmm. And those are the things that I make sure at, at the end, as I finish setting the scene, okay, now let me look at the scene. And have I covered color, smell, sound, taste, temperature, thoughts, feelings, are all of those things covered in the scene? And then it's almost like, okay, that one's done. Now I can close that scene and go to the next one at the end of my last layer. And then when I get all the way through it, then I am done and I'm ready to edit it. All right, so let's see. I'm going to say Janet kind of popped in with a question about editing that kind of follows on that, that when you edit, do you do it scene by scene or chapter by chapter? So my editing process, um, I run a spell and grammar check in three different word processors because they all use different dictionaries. And then I do a I, I have the search. checklist open that I could share if that would make it easier. The grit, nitty gritty self editing. Yes. <laughs> um, it's hanging. I have it hanging up on my bulletin board. Um, I need permission to share. Oh, let me see if I can find you, Greg. Hold on just a second. I'm, I'm the only dude. First. <laughs> Represent. Yeah, I can't find your name in the participants list, but I know you're here. Got it. I got it. You got him. Okay. There we go. Hey, all right. You're you're lucky today. The Northern Lights are here. <laughs> oh, John is a dude too. Someone says there's a okay, John here. Just, uh, I need permission to share the screen. I'm not. Um, let me make you co-host. There you there you go. All right, let's try it now. Okay, can y'all see where it says nitty gritty or? Yep, yep. Okay, does that help, babe? Yeah, you're just gonna have to scroll for me. So go down, go down, go down. Wait. What? Here's the parts of the book. I do that last. I still haven't done it for the book that's up for pre-order. <laughs> <laughs> um, I still have. Bible study questions to write and a res recipes to write. But anyway, um, so I do a spell check and a grammar check and then I, then I search for passive verbs. Is, are, was, were, be, being, and been are the words I search for. So one at a time, I search for those words. And like I said, inside the, the dialogue, I leave them, but in, in the narrative, I find a way to reword the, the sentence or paragraph in order to make it as active as possible. Um, it's, it's okay to occasionally use, in my opinion, passive verbs in narrative, um, but it's never okay to have a passive sentence. And if you have to use a passive verb, you better use it sparingly in, for me. I'm speaking of myself. And then I do, uh, I search for the word seem because did he seem angry or was he angry? Uh, did he seem to feel, if, did he seem to be offended by what you just said or did you offend him? Um, that's the kind of thing. And then, and it's just simple. It's just simply lazy week writing to use the word seem because that just means you're not describing thoughts and feelings and setting the scene. 
um, I also then search for fanboys, which is for and or nor but yet. And I search for them with the capital letter because I speak with fanboys and I often write with them as well, but it's not really good to start your sentences with too many of them because the reader will be exhausted at the end if you have too many fanboys. So occasionally they're good for really great, fast paced thoughts and feelings, but you need to chill on them as much as possible because it just keeps the, re it's almost like a, lo a long run on sentence even when you put in punctuation that ends the sentence. Um, and then the rest is just tweaking dialogue and tweaking character and tweaking descriptions and all of that. But because of the way that I layer, a lot of that I pick up as I'm going, as I'm doing. My end edit, uh, I've, I've pretty much handled most of it other than the spelling grammar check and the uh, passive verb and fanboy check because I'm reading each scene each sentence in each scene five or six times through. And so that gives me a lot of opportunity to uh, correct weak sentences and identify weak sentences and, you know, all of that. All right, let me go back to the top of the questions. How do you handle POV? I make each scene only one POV. The only time I've ever not was I had a scene start in her POV and end in his, but the transition was almost like the hunt for Red October when they switch Sean Connery from speaking Russian to English. It's just like he goes, like the camera even goes into a book and he's, he's going into it speaking Russian and he comes out of it speaking English. And you don't even realize it's happened. Like your brain just kind of accepts that that just happened. And I did, I did the same thing with that scene. Somehow, I don't even remember what I did, but I started in hers and I ended in his, but I didn't break any rules doing it. But the rest of the time, I'm almost intentional about his scene, her scene. And in fact, like my first draft, my first action and dialogue, if you look at, I don't have one ready now where I would show you, but um, the first sentence of every scene is almost his name, her name, his name, her name, his name, her name, because it's just my brain setting up that it's him or my brain setting up that it's her. And I have to, in, in one of my edits, go through and make sure that I don't start every scene with a name. <laughs> um, let's see. I might have lost where I am. There was a question about children's books. And, and I don't know if you have any experience with, with that. How do you know how much to put in and not bore them with too much details? I don't write children's books. And I never have, or I would, I would tell you. Someone said, kiss things are usually so boring in Christian romance with the ever, he deepened the kiss sentence. I love the way Hallie puts it here. Thank you. <laughs> I was, before I was a Christian romance writer, I was a secular romance writer, and I am quite good at the scenes. I used to be very good at them. I don't write them anymore. I don't read them anymore, but I used to. I actually have, a couple of times I've sent my street team a scene saying, please tell me if this is okay. <laughs> <laughs> it might have been a little bit too passionate this time. No one's ever said, oh, that was way too passionate. But I think that there's some, some of older readers that get my book. I, those are the bad reviews. <laughs> I just don't like all that kissing in Christian books. That You just got one of those recently. I don't. <laughs> oh, I just don't like books about all this kissing. Why can't they just hold hands and <laughs> trade their promise rings? <laughs> Oh, man. I'll need to come. Oh, Hallie, uh, someone asked if I could share a link to the uh, He Said, She Said class. I, I'm willing to do that with your permission. It's on the Christian Self-Publishing. Yeah. Do you have the link or do you need me to pull it? I have it open. No, I got it. Do I? Uh, let's see. Here we are. Okay. Finally, I finally caught up to the questions. <laughs> Can you tell us about your editing process? I did. Children's books. I love layers and momentum that it captures each time. Thank you. I honestly feel like the way that I write, and I know it's the way that my brain works. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that if you write differently than me, that you're writing incorrectly. But I feel like 
it gives me an opportunity to truly build each scene in a, in a very special and emotional and spiritual, whatever, whatever the purpose of that scene is, I really feel like it gives me an opportunity to truly nail it. Um, but maybe if I wrote a different way, I would have a different process that does the same end result. So someone said for one book, I used a text to voice app to listen out loud, even though without emotion to help the editing. So that is a great, great end to editing. Greg and I use that, but we read it to each other. So one of us is reading while the other has it open and it's so easy to find the dialogue was wrong or, oh, he already walked across the room. You just had him walk across the room again. You, Cause you use a different part of your brain. See, now I'm getting in my editing class. You use a different part of your brain to hear and to speak than you use to read. It's actually a different part of your brain. And so you're going to catch different things. And so you're, when you're reading your brain actually makes a lot of corrections so that you can just keep reading. But when you're speaking and, and reading out loud, when you're speaking and hearing, those corrections aren't being made. And so that's how you, that's why he, hearing it is very important. And I remember, so my very first book I published, was, so all of my books are indie published. I just signed a three book contract with Ravel, but up until now, all 30 books I have are self-published. And um, the first three books I wrote and published were not professionally edited. and so when my audio guy was doing the, so he, the, my audio guy did like my 15th book first. And then he went back and started at the Jewel series, which was my first series. And so I had done On the Ropes. I'd listened to On the Ropes. Everything was great. It was great audio. He's a really brilliant artist. And then he did Sapphire Ice. And like halfway through the first chapter, I called him crying. And I'm like, can I please rewrite this book? And if I rewrite it, will you re-record it? <laughs> And he was like, absolutely, you know, let's put the bet. And he ended up getting nominated for a national award with, with Sapphire Ice. Wow. So um, he actually lost to John Rhys Davies won the award that he was nominated for. So we were like, okay, you can yeah, lose to John Rhys Davies. <laughs> the next year he was nominated for one of your books too and came in second again to yeah. the guy who played like the Hawkman in, in Flash. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's really good in my he audio. He was guy. also the king, like Jar Jar Binks is king in uh, Star oh, yeah. Wars. Oh, yeah, him. Him. I don't know wow. his name, but um, nobody anyway, knows his because name. I was suddenly hearing this book that hadn't been professionally edited, and it wasn't the first book I self-published, and I had learned a lot in you know twenty books Absolutely. that I hadn't learned at the time, and so um, that was a vital thing. Reading. All right, let me go back to this. So I want to jump real quick into the questions because we were running yes. out of time. Um, okay, so the next question going down would be Carissa's, and she says, you mentioned voice to text app. Do you use that on a regular basis? Um, I heard you mention Dragon. Yes, I use Dragon. Um, I have to now. My, um, my hands are mm. not, I've written a lot. <laughs> and I actually wondered if I would be able to. It was something... Um, I wasn't sure that I would be able to create. I thought it would hinder my creativity. And what hinders it is knowing someone can hear me, like I'll stop and I'll start typing. Uh, so if I know that no one can hear me and you know my door is shut or I'm walking, I'll take, I'll, uh, I have like a really high speed microphone headset and I can put it in my phone and I, and I am able to, Dragon will also take that and, wow. uh, It'll, it'll take an audio file and make a text of it. Mm -hmm. So if I, if I know no one can hear me, I'm fine. But as soon as I know someone can hear me, even my children, I'm like, clickety, clickety. <laughs> um, but I, I, I had to, I, it was a stumbling process, stumbling learning process in my last book I wrote. And then I, now I'm fine. Now I'm fine. And I, I can talk so much faster. It's amazing. My productivity is like, maybe up by half Wow! just from doing the wow. speech instead of, cause it's like, I don't know what the difference is. I have no idea because I type really fast. I type like 120 words a minute. So you'd think that it wouldn't, but maybe I talk faster. I don't know. <laughs> uh, okay. So next question. Oh, yeah. I was going to ask everybody to come on in cause we are running out of time, but if there are any other questions we can do that. Yeah. Um, yeah with Leslie, she's asking, um, she sees a lot of run on sentences. Um, and authors doing it for emphasis. So she says, should this be used or not? I'm seeing it more and more as I'm reading. What are your thoughts? I, 
I think that if you had an educated reader, it would distract them. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that there's ways to create the action, the fast paced action that's not a run on sentence. I would almost say it would be better to use shorter sentences. So the more active your, your scene is, the shorter your sentences should be mm -hmm. instead of the other way around. Um, and then last question, I guess, um, lots of people excited about the editing stuff. Um, and then Renee says, do you guys sleep? And then what is your work week? Like? To be I try to what is my work up, day? Actually. Is that what you said? <laughs> your work week. <laughs> uh, you know, I actually, that was my Monday morning coffee and chat this week. So um, I can put up my YouTube and it, I go through my whole daily schedule. Oh. <laughs> yeah. That, that was my, I do a Monday morning coffee and chat and I, uh, I answer reader questions and that was a question. So let me find it. And I'll give you the link. So a lot of folks are asking for the checklist. Um, that is actually a work in progress. Um, or I would share it. I think Greg is developing a class with that. I, I, am. I have a, I have a class for editing, but it's that, that checklist is it's new since the conference. Yeah, this is the right link. Okay. So that goes to this week's chat that has my full, I talk about my day. Thanks for sharing that Holly. And thanks for just sharing so much information um i i loved this and i think i want to try it i i'm a big proponent of just studying how different people write and and looking at the processes and then trying them and then figuring out your own and you know you're taking maybe one thing from one person one thing from another person and what seems to work organically for you and and not to be afraid, never say, I could never do that. Try it at least once and see, because it might be just the thing that, that does work for you and you wouldn't want to just push it away because you think you couldn't do it. Absolutely wonderful, wonderful. Does anyone have any um, last minute, last question, last comment real quick? All right. Um, then thank you again all for being here if you're on the replay thank you so so much for for watching again invite you to to join us live and in our facebook group i am sorry i did not look up to see what's coming up next week melissa do you know oh, hey. <laughs> yeah my, my on the brain spot. <laughs> ashley, jones. ashley jones is coming on next week and she oh, yeah she's going to be talking about um break uh utilizing the general market in your um, writing. She'll talk about her children's books and her cast iron cookbook too. Oh, good, good. That sounds really great. And that's selling list on Amazon before it released too, with that cast iron book. So it's exciting. That is exciting. That's fun. Well, and yes, and thanks so much to, to Hallie and to Greg for being here and invite you all to stay on just for a few more moments for the after party and <laughs> everyone else. Bye-bye. See you next week.